They can't, glory to thee. Now, my, I'll do that. I'll do a session on, on limitomet. Maybe later tonight or tomorrow, Lord willing, because I'm running out of time. i got to pick up my kids. Let's see. I'll do that, I promise. God willing. Did the live stream start it? Okay, it says it started, right? Sound good? They can see the screen? In Jesus' name, praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, trusting the Father to sanctify us, sanctify me once again to do justice to this topic, filled with wisdom and power and love and holiness and faithfulness to the Word of our God from the Holy Spirit to magnify Jesus Christ when His preeminent existence appeared as the messenger of God. I pray the Father protect me from error, confusion, and stammering and bless you to understand these points and fill us with the Holy Spirit and with love for Jesus to love Him even more and be more holy and save us from the evil one and cover us and our loved ones under the precious blood of Jesus, my wife and daughters, covered by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Bless this time, Father, and save us from the evil one. We love you. We love your son. We love your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The second part of my discussion on the evidence establishing that the messenger of God is Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his pre existence, and that this messenger is not a creature, but he's God Almighty. Let's go back to Joshua 5, because I want to touch on something else in Joshua 5. I've established that the commander of the army of Yahweh, the captain of the host of Yahweh, the Lord Jehovah, is the angel of God. They're one and the same. And demonstrated from Revelation, that's Jesus Christ our Lord. The evidence is irrefutable. Let me show you how this establishes that Christ is Jehovah God who became flesh. Not the Father, not the Spirit, but one with the Father and the Spirit. Let's go back. Now remember this before we go back to Joshua 5. In the biblical manuscripts, there are no chapter divisions and no verses. That means you have to determine from the reading of the particular book where one context ends and another begins. So don't forget that. No chapter divisions, no verses in the manuscripts. That was added later on in you know, medieval period. With that said, if you're reading Joshua 5 and a Hebrew scroll, there is no chapter 5. There's no chapter 6. It's just one continuous narrative. So you have to determine when one context ends and another begins. With that said, we're going to now read Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 and 15, with chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, back to back. So we're going to read Joshua 5, verses 13 and 15, and 6, verses 1 and 2. Because watch what's going to happen when you realize there are no chapter divisions. Remember who's speaking to Joshua. I'm going to wait for him to post chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Light everyone else, watch this. Now, Lizzie. The first part is now live stream. It's recorded, so you can go back and listen from the beginning because this is stuff you need to know and you're witness to Muslims by the grace of Jesus. Now read with me. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man, appearing in human form. Notice not a man with wings, by the way. Over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host, host here means the heavenly host, the host that live in heaven, the host that obey God's will, the host that God uses to carry out his will and even to punish his enemies. I'm the captain of the host of the Lord Jehovah, am I now come? Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord Adoni unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. For the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord Jehovah said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Did you catch it? Okay, I'm confused. In chapter 5, verse 13 and 15, it's the man who's speaking to Joshua, the commander of the host of the Lord. <clears throat> All of a sudden, in chapter 6, verse 2, it's now the Lord speaking to Joshua. <clears throat> What's going on here? In Jesus' name. <clears throat> Explain that to me, guys. Who's speaking to Joshua in the context? Who's speaking to Joshua in the context? <laughs> the captain, right? But wait, M.M. Read verse 2 again of chapter 6. The Lord said unto Joshua. So how did the captain end up being the Lord speaking to Joshua? Oh, you got it now. Light, are you seeing it? 
The captain is the Lord. The Lord is the captain. He is Jehovah appearing in human form, although he's distinct from Jehovah. You catch it? Are you seeing it? The Lord who spoke to Joshua is the captain of the army of the Lord, the Lord hosts. They're one and the same. Before I move on, are you seeing this? I need more feedback. Come on, help me out here. Do you see that too light? I want to make sure you're getting it. If you're confused, let me know. Say, look, I'm kind of confused. So I can help clarify the point. But if you're getting it, we can move on to another point. Good. Now, Joshua 5.14. They're the man who is the Lord speaking to Joshua. Just like the angel speaks, as Jehovah speaks. The angel who speaks is Jehovah speaks. The captain who speaks is Jehovah who speaks. Because the captain is Jehovah in human form. The Lord in human form. Now, now watch who he is again in 14. Now, if you go to interlinearbible.org, interlinearbible.org, and you look at the Hebrew of Joshua 5.14, you're going to see that here the phrase, the captain of the host, is Sar. Sebowith. Some will pronounce it Sebowith. Sar Sebowith. Right? Seboth. Sebowith. Okay? Sar Sebowith. Pay attention to that. Because I'm going to show you this exact phrase in Daniel. The word captain of the host, commander of the host, in Hebrew, Sar Sebowith. Seboth. Some will pronounce it Seboth. Everyone pronounce it Hebrew. I don't speak English, let alone Hebrew. All right. Now let's go to Daniel 8, 11, and 25. Daniel chapter 8, verse 11, and verse 25 to see this figure mentioned once again in the context of the Antichrist figure, the one who foreshadows the Antichrist, right, making war against him. Anti Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes IV was a type of the Antichrist. So Daniel speaks about him, but also uses him as a shadow of the one to come. So let's go to Daniel 8, 11, and 25. Watch here. Who this commander of those is. Daniel 8, 11, and 25. Watch here. Chapter 8, verse 11, and 25. Yea, he, this is talking about the little horn who comes to prominence. Prominence, and in, historically, this is referring to Antiochus, the, the, the king of Syria who attacked Jerusalem and defiled it and the temple, slaughtered thousands of Jews, built an altar to Zeus, and slaughtered a, a pig on the... On the altar of the most holy place defiled it anyway notice what he's going to do yea he magnified himself this little horn to the prince of the host that's the same in hebrew the word prince of the host is the same word in joshua 5 14. he's going to magnify himself against he's going to oppose the sar sabot sabot he's going to magnify himself and oppose and defy the commander of the host of heaven. Same Hebrew word. Are you seeing it? You understand what this means? Antiochus is going to pose the same figure that appeared to Joshua. The man who appeared to Joshua, he's the prince of the host. Same Hebrew words. Don't believe me? Check it out. Sar, so both. Same Hebrew phrase. So it's the same person. So this Antiochus is going to pose the same one who came to Joshua to help him fight the Canaanites. He's going to pose him. But now notice who this one is. In Daniel 8, 11, he's called the prince of the host. Same Hebrew words. You can translate the word sar as commander, captain, or prince. Same word of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice will be taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Now notice who the ca captain, commander, captain of the host is in 25. Pay attention. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many, just like the Antichrist will. So he's a picture of the Antichrist. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now pay attention who the prince of the host is. Sar Saboth. Sar Saboth. Right? Everyone to pronounce it. Everyone to transliterate it. It's called Sar Sarim. The prince, the captain of the host, is the prince of all princes. He's the ruler of all rulers. Is that interesting? What's Jesus' name in Revelation? King of kings and Lord of lords. So the prince of princes, who is the prince of the host, who is the commander, the captain of the host that Joshua saw, is none other than the Lord of lords and king of kings. 
Sar Sarim. In fact, in Isaiah 9, the Messiah, the child to be born to sit on David's throne, is called Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, Ruler of Peace, Captain of Peace, Commander of Peace. Are you seeing a pattern here? Are you seeing that in the Old Testament, this Prince of Princes, who is the Prince of the Host, whom Antiochus opposes, is the captain of the host that Joshua saw, whom the New Testament identifies as Jesus Christ. You catching it? Because according to Revelation 19.16 and 17.14, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Jesus. Well, if he's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that would make him the Prince of Princes. And just like Antiochus opposed Jesus at the time of Daniel, let's go to Revelation 17.14. Revelation 17, 14. Not only did Antiochus oppose Jesus, all rulers, all kings seek to oppose and dethrone Jesus. Because in Revelation 17, 14, talking about the ten kings, the ten horns, who give their power to the beast, notice what it says in Revelation 17, 14 about them. These shall make war with the Lamb, just like Daniel 8. Antiochus made war against the prince of the host, the prince of princes. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him called and chosen and faithful. I pray we are with him. Are you seeing the same pattern, history repeating itself? In the Old Testament, Antiochus opposes the ruler, the commander, the captain, the prince of the host, who is the prince of princes. Later on, other kings, like Antiochus before them, Oppose the Lamb, who is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. What else could the Bible tell us and show us to convince us that Jesus Christ is the same captain of the host that Joshua saw, who when he spoke to Joshua was Jehovah speaking, who is the very prince of the host, the prince of princes of Daniel 8. What else do we need? What else could the Bible say to convince us this is one and the same person. Anything else? And are you seeing this? Is it making sense to you guys? Because I know I said a mouthful, which is why I keep repeating myself. For all of you listening, do you see how clear the evidence is? This is Jesus Christ. Daniel is talking about Jesus Christ as the prince of the host, the commander of those, the captain of the host, who's the prince of princes. And because Christ is the same today, yesterday, forever, from the very beginning, evil rulers sought to fight him and dethrone him to their shame and destruction. Light, are you getting it too? Because now is the knockout. Here's where you're going to get blown away. This is nothing. Daniel 8, that little horn who rises to prominence, who tries to defy the prince of the host, who's the prince of princes, that same horn, that same wicked ruler is mentioned in Daniel 11. But now in Daniel 11, notice who this little horn of Daniel 8, who's Antiochus, who's a shadow of the Antichrist. Notice who he's going to oppose in Daniel 11. Let's go to Daniel 11, 36, 37. Now let's see if you guys catch this. Daniel 11, 36 to 37. Let's see if you catch it. Watch here. Let's see if you're going to catch it. It's the same wicked ruler. The same wicked ruler of Daniel 8 is being mentioned again by Daniel in Daniel 11. Notice who this ruler now is going to oppose in Daniel 11, 36 to 37. And the king, same king, same little horn of Daniel 8. Don't believe me, just read it. Read Daniel 8, all 11. It's the same one. Shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that is determined shall be done neither shall regard the guard the god of his fathers he won't have any regard for the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all wait he's going to say blasphemous things marvelous things in opposition to the god of gods but wait let's go back to daniel 8 11 and 25 who is the god of gods that this king will set himself against and oppose and blaspheme Daniel 8, 11, and 25. Let's see. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And then later on, 25, he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Now I'm really blown away. 
This little horn who rises to prominence after Alexander's empire is destroyed and separated into four separate parts, this evil king will oppose the prince of hosts, magnify himself against the prince of princes, but in Daniel 11, he's magnifying himself, opposing the God of gods. Wait, are you trying to tell me that the God of gods that he opposes is the prince of princes, the prince of the host? But wait, the prince of the host is the captain of the army of the Lord that appeared as a man to Joshua. When he speaks, Jehovah speaks, who happens to be the angel of Jehovah, which according to the New Testament is Jesus Christ. So you're saying to me, Jesus Christ is the God of gods? If we let scripture interpret scripture, he's the God of gods, which is why he's the Lord of lords, which is why he's the king of kings, which is why he's the prince of princes, the prince of the host, the com commander, the captain of the host. This is all one and the same figure. So the prince of princes, the prince of those that this king opposes, according to Daniel 8, is the same wicked king that opposes the God of gods in Daniel 11, 36, 37. But that God of gods, who's the prince of princes, who's the captain of the host, the prince of the host, according to Revelation 17, 14, and 19, 11 to 21, is Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and kings, king of kings. And you're telling me the Bible does not identify Jesus Christ as God Almighty in the flesh? Distinct from the Father and the Spirit, yet one with them? Let's pause for a moment. And tell me what's running in your minds. Because I still got more. Tell me what's running in your minds, guys. What are you thinking right now? Especially you like coming out of the background you came out of. Yeah, well, you're talking about who the figure is. Well, that's another story. Amazing, right? You better believe it. He's there from the beginning. He'll be there till the end because Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the first and last. So if he's God and he cannot lie, why are you shocked to find him in the Old Testament? You know why light, they can't believe it? For the same reason for years you can believe it. Brainwashing, demonization, blindness caused by rebellion, sin, and Satan, right? Until God in his love for you waited patiently to bring you and open your eyes, right? Because if you were a Muslim and I told you this, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't accept it. You would be debating me. You see? Demonization. stiff neck rebellion. Bondage to sin. A refusal to see. Sila, as I said earlier, if you're seeking God and crying out to him, he will make himself known to you, which is why you're here. Well, light, do you see why they won't debate me now? I'm not trying to toot my horn. God forbid I become arrogant and think I'm great or God's gift. God save me from that. God forbid. Lord, never let me think that way of, my, of myself. They literally fear me. And I, if you if you don't believe me, Lizzie knows how to untash. Ask her. When my name is mentioned, this is what she told me. I'm going by her witness. They get angry and run away. They hate me with a passion, <laughs> which is funny, right? You know what I'm laughing? Honestly, I, I'm not trying to be humble, and God forbid I ever become arrogant and believe my own press. See, Lizzie's telling you, it's true. You know what I'm laughing? Of all my brothers and sisters in the ministry, and all glory to God, he gets the glory, I'm the least educated, right? Some of them have got PhDs, they've gone to seminary. No seminary, no college. Ain't it funny? God has a sense of humor. He takes an idiot from the world like me and fills him with wisdom for his glory, right? To show it's not it's not your qualifications. It's trusting in God who can qualify you. Really, honestly, I'm proof of it. If you have any doubt that you can do this, look to me. Honestly, I am no better than you and I'm not educated. Seriously. That's why you shouldn't get afraid and overwhelmed. I can't do that. Of course you can. Look at me. By way of testament, I want people on YouTube to hear this. GED. I didn't even get a high school diploma. No college, no seminary. Trust God, the Almighty. He possesses infinite wisdom. He can give you wisdom to silence PhDs. Seriously. I And I'm, you know I'm boasting in my idiocy, Silla? To encourage you to see how awesome and real God is.
Because I hope this is going to now blow your mind away and say, wow, God, how real are you to take an idiot and give him such wisdom? He can do it through you, but you got to trust, honestly. When it comes down to it, really the question is, do you trust? Do you believe that he's that real? Do you trust? Do you believe he's that real? I do. I really do. So he gets the glory. I will boast about what a fool I am, an uneducated bum, so you can see how great God is. So let this encourage you, all right? If I can do it, you can do it. Seriously. Honestly. Just study the materials. See God's face in intense worship, prayer. Don't think, don't remember, it's not about knowledge. If you make knowledge your goal, that's an idol. Worship God intensely. Pray to him. Talk to him. Sing to him. Love him. Read his word. Listen to his word. Obey his word. Serve people practically. And ask God to help you know him more intimately so you can be more effective. And he will do wonders through you. Honestly, he will. Trust me, he will. Trust me, he will. These stories in the Bible are not make-believe. These are real historical events, real miracles, real people whom God used in a mighty way. That God is still alive. He can do it till this day. And we're going to see those signs and wonders again as Jesus' second coming approaches. You're going to see people being fed supernaturally with manna from heaven again. You're going to see it again as we approach the return of Christ. Watch, you'll see. Revelation bears witness. So be encouraged, all right? Be encouraged. Now, coming back to the point, is it clear that Jesus Christ is the God of gods of Daniel 11, the prince of the host, the prince of princes of Daniel 8, who is the captain of the host of the Lord that appeared as a man to Joshua, who when he spoke to Joshua, was God speaking, Jehovah speaking, who is the angel of the Lord? Is that clear? If you follow the line of evidence and piece, these, and piece all these <clears throat> together, Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord, who is the captain of the host, who is the prince of princes, Right, the God of gods, who's Jehovah, who appeared to Moses, who claims to be God, who's worshipped as God, and can do only what God does. Clear? All right, let's look at some more of this. Now, before I go, how much time has elapsed on the live stream? But you got to make sure, because I want to keep it within an hour. If I can do a little less than an hour, that'd be fine. But you know what? An hour won't kill anybody. Good. Praise the Lord. We got time. Okay. More evidence that the angel is God. You want more evidence that the angel is God? I'm excited for you guys, man. Okay. More evidence that the angel is God. All right. Now, we're not going to read all of this, but I want you to write down for yourselves Judges 13, 3 to 24. You write it down. We're not going to read all of it. I'm going to sum it up. Judges chapter 13, verses 3 to 24. It's a story of Samson's birth, the birth of Samson. The story goes like this. A man appeared to Manoah's wife. The text says it's the angel of God. If you look at it, it says the angel of God. Now, Manoah's wife doesn't know for certain it's the angel of God, but the man tells her that she's pregnant. She's going to give birth to a son. She has to make sure that she doesn't drink any strong intoxicants, intoxicants and other things because that child will be consecrated as a Nazarite to God. Okay? Now, Manoah's wife goes to Manoah and says, Look, a man of God came to me and told me X, Y, and Z. You know? He had the appearance of the angel of God, so she knew there was something amazing about his appearance. Something that caught her eye that made her wonder, is it the angel of God? And she told her husband, he said, I'm pregnant and this is what I'm supposed to do. So then Manoah prayed and he asked God, send that man of God to instruct us what we should do. So then the man of God appears again. Now, don't forget, the man of God is the angel of God. Now, the angel of God appears to him as a man. So he tells him what he's supposed to do. Do this, do that. This is what you're supposed to do, right? And then Manoah says, you know, what should we do to honor you? When it comes to pass, we have a son. What should we do to honor you? And he says, well, offer a sacrifice. We're going to pick it up there. We're going to pick it up from there. With that said, let's see what happens. In Judges 13, 17 to 18. Manoah asks him his name. Watch what happens. Hold on a second, guys. One second. Okay, go to Judges 13. Manoah. Ask him what is his name. Judges 13, 17, 18. Now watch what happens here. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord. He didn't know it was the angel of the Lord, by the way. What is thy name? And when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. What's your name? So that when this stuff happens, we can honor you. The angel of the Lord, Jehovah said unto him, Why ask, askest thou thus after my name? Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is secret. 
unlike Gabriel and Michael, when they appear, they'll tell you, I am Gabriel. Or they'll say, this is Gabriel. This angel says, why do you ask my name, seeing it's secret? Now, the word secret here is Pali. Pali. P-A-L-I-Y. L-I-Y. Pali can also mean it is wonderful. Literally, what the angel is saying is, why do you ask my name, seeing it's beyond comprehension? That's what the word means. Something so wonderful, so wondrous, it's beyond your ability to comprehend. Did you know that? That's what Pali means. Notice what the angel says. Don't inquire about my name. It's too wonderful for you to comprehend. Because in the biblical mindset, again, don't take my word for it. Get any commentary. Look at any lexical source. When you speak of a person's name, you're talking about their personality, their characteristics, their nature, their authority. So basically, what the angel is saying is, don't inquire about my nature, my characteristics. It's beyond your ability. It's beyond comprehension. It's too wonderful. That's why other translations will wonder it is, seeing it as wonderful. Are you with me there? Who does this angel think he is to tell Manoah, my name, my nature, my personality, my characteristics, it's too wonderful for you to know, don't even ask. What does he think he is? Only God is beyond comprehension, beyond understanding, too wonderful for us, wonder, wonderful for us to comprehend. What does he think he is? You see what a shocking response that is? Shocking, isn't it? Now let's read 19 to 20. Don't take my word for it. It's Pali. Let's read 19 to 20. Watch here. Watch what's going to happen. It's going to get really exciting. Genesis 13, 19 to 20. So Manoah took a kid, meaning a, a goat, a baby goat, with meat offering or a baby lamb. The kid here doesn't mean a human child. Just want you to understand. I don't want people to think this is a child sacrifice. And offered it upon a rock unto the Lord Jehovah. And the angel did wondrously. Remember he said, my name is wonderful beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. It's too wonderful for you. Notice he does something wonderful, something mind-boggling. Because remember, the angel is appearing as a man. You read the chapter. He's in human form. And in that human form, notice what he does. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from, a, from off the altar, that the angel Lord ascended into the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. Can you imagine that sight? Because remember, this actually happened, folks. This is an actual historical event. Imagine you're standing there and there's a man standing before you. All of a sudden, he looks at you and he jumps into the flame and disappears. What do you think is going to happen to you? <laughs> Look at that. What do you think is going to happen to you seeing that, that happen to you? Here's a man standing for you and you're, there's a flame. And he's looking at you and jumps into the flame and disappears. What happened? You're going to be mind blown, aren't you? You're going to be blown away, right? You're going to be blown away, right? Just want to make sure you're listening. And by the way, is anyone on YouTube listening? You bet. You're going to pass out from shock. But now, here's where it gets even more amazing 21 and 22. In fact, let's read 21 and 23. You think this is amazing? Here's where you're going to get more, more blown away. 21 to 23. Notice what Manoah says. Judges 13, 21, 23. Notice this. Watch this here. If you want proof this angel is no creature but God appearing in human form, who happens to be Christ, watch what we're going to read right here. In Judges 13, 21, 23, notice. But the angel of the Lord Jehovah did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Now notice what the narrator says. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say Manoah knew it was God. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Now, if he knew it was the angel of the Lord, explain to me why he says what he says in 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. What do you mean you've seen God? I thought, you know, it's the angel of the Lord. Yeah. And we saw God. But wait, you saw a man whom you know is the angel of the Lord. Yeah. So then why are you afraid that you're going to die? Why do you think you saw God? Now, notice what she says in 23. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, 
he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering in our hands. So wait, that man who accepted that offering is the Lord? Who didn't kill them, but accepted their offering? Right? Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. But the one who was speaking to them, who told them these things, was the man who's the angel of the Lord, the angel of God. And yet here Manoah says, we're going to die because we saw God in human form. And then his wife says, no, no, no. If the Lord wanted to kill us, he wouldn't have told us these things and accepted his offering. But the Lord who was talking to them, who accepted the offering, was the angel who appeared as a man. Are you guys getting this or no? It's like awfully silent. Do you understand what you just saw? The angel of God who appeared as a man is God himself appearing visibly to his servants. The Lord himself. If actually, Sila, you have to go back to part one. You came in in the midst of my discussion. I already explained that the word angel in Hebrew, malach, and in Greek, angelos, means messenger. That's all it means. The context will define whether that messenger is a human creature or a spirit creature or God. There's only one angel, one messenger who's not a creature. And it's this one that we're talking about because that's Jesus Christ. But you got to go back to part one, which is now archived. You can listen to it and learn. Not divine being, it should be God. He is God, right? Not a divine being, he is God who is Jehovah. So notice this angel, he appears as a man. This angel says, my name, my character, my nature, it's secret because it's beyond understanding. It's wonderful, Pali, it's wonderful, right? And to see this angel is to see God, to look at God, to speak to God when you see this angel, right? You, you, you see all these connections? Because I'm going to connect it with Jesus again. Remember what he said in 18? Why do you ask me my name? Seeing it is wonderful, beyond understanding. It's secret. The word is Pali. Pali. Okay, now, let me make a connection. Let's go to Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Let me connect this angel who is God with Messiah again. That's because they say that it's too sacred and you don't want to take it in, in vain. So that's why they choose not to say the name. In order to safeguard against using God's name in vain. But now, MM, follow with me. Remember Judges 13, 18? The angel said, why do you ask my name? Seeing it as wonderful, secret, beyond comprehension, beyond understanding. Pali, wonderful, meaning it's beyond your ability. It's too wonderful for you to comprehend. Only God is beyond comprehension. Too wonderful for us to comprehend. But the angel says, I am too. That's why I don't inquire about my nature. It's beyond your ability. Watch the connection. And if you really want to be blown away, and if I could do this, I can't, because if I go on internet, the people who are watching a live stream will lose the image of Pal Talk and see my picture. But if someone can do this for me, maybe glory to thee, if you can look up Aleppo Septu Septuagint, English translation of the Septuagint, you're going to see confirmation of this. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, pay attention, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, Il Gibor, God the mighty, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here's that word, Sar again. Prince of Peace, Sar. Prince of Princes, Prince of the Host, right? <clears throat> of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. So notice the child who is born, who is a son given, sits on David's throne. That's the Messiah. And we know to be Jesus. But I don't I don't think you caught it. Notice one of his names. One of his names is wonderful. Pele. From the same root as Pali. The angel is Pali and the child is Pele. Comes from the same Hebrew word root and it basically means the same thing. The child who's born is wonderful, like the angel is wonderful. Same root with the same meaning. Are you catching it? No wonder the child is born is the mighty God, El Gibor, because that child is the very angel who is wonderful, who is God. And you want proof that the child born is actually the angel of God? You know how the Jews rendered Isaiah 9, 6? 
You know who the child is in the Greek version of Isaiah 9 6? The Jews that translated Isaiah 9 6 into Greek. When they translate into Greek, the Greek version of the Old Testament is not simply a translation, but a commentary. Because at times they don't translate literally, they paraphrase the Hebrew in order to give you what they believe the meaning is. You know how they rendered Isaiah 9 6? Now, maybe glory to thee or someone can find it. You know how they render it? The child is none other than the angel of great counsel. They identify the, the child as the angel himself from the great counsel of God, whose counsels are great. That's how they translated Isaiah 9 6. So even those Jews identify the child as the angel of the Lord. The Jews that translated Isaiah 9 into Greek. So if someone can post the Greek, feel free to do it. If not, check it up at your own convenience and your own leisure for confirmation. Do you understand the point with the Greek? The Jews who translated Isaiah 9 into Greek didn't give a word-for-word -word translation, but paraphrased the meaning. And in their paraphrase, the child, the child to be born is the angel, the angel of great counsel meaning the angel whose counsels are great and who belongs to the great assembly in heaven, right? And here, Ed Van Halen took the Greek and went to Google, and Google translation says, and called the name of this great angel of God. Bam! You catch it? So wait, Isaiah 9, 6, that child to be born, who's a son given, who is wonderful, who is the mighty God, is actually the angel of God. Yep, that's how even the Jews saw it. Like, did you catch that or no? I want to make sure everyone got it. If someone's confused, put a two. Say, look, I'm still confused because I'm not going to rush through this. That's okay, please think. So if you're late, don't ask because you got to have been here from the beginning. So it does not apply to the late comer. Johnny, come lately. So you need to repent and face the east. But it's archived, so you can go back and listen to it at your own leisure. Okay? So face these and repent. But anyway, for the rest of you, clear that the angel of God who appeared to Manoah as a man is God himself appearing in human form, which is why the angel told Manoah, don't ask my name. It is wonderful, Pali. It's beyond comprehension. Because the angel is incomprehensible by nature, but only God is incomprehensible. Now again, so you don't miss the point that the angel is God that Manoah saw. Let's see what Manoah said again. Judges 13, 21, 22. And Isaiah 9 says, the child who will be born, who is a son given to sit on David's throne, whom we know to be the Messiah, Jesus, he is wonderful in his counsels, the mighty God, identifying him as the angel of God, who is God appearing in human form, which is how even the Jews understood it, that translated the Hebrew into Greek. The Greek version, the Jews translated Isaiah 9, 6 to, be, to mean that the child born is the angel of great counsel. But going back to the point again, Judges 13, 21, 22, notice what Manoah says, but the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah and to his wife. That was it. He stopped appearing. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Notice what it doesn't say. Then Manoah realized that it was the Lord, that it was Jehovah, that it was God. He knew it was the angel. Well, if he knew he's, he was the angel, please explain to me, verse 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Wow. This is like Exodus 3, right? Where in Exodus 3, 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. And then it says, God called out from the bush in verse 4. And verse 6 says, Manoah is afraid to look at God. So, I'm sorry, Moses was afraid to look at God. So Moses, looking at the angel, knew he was looking at God, which is why he was afraid to look at the angel, because that was God appearing to him. Same reaction as Manoah. Same reaction as Manoah. Manoah tells his wife, we will die because we've seen God, even though it says that Manoah knew it was the angel that he saw. Guys, can you help me understand all this? I'm really confused. Why is it when the angel appeared to Moses, Moses thought he was seeing God, why is it when the angel appeared to Manoah, Manoah thought that although this was the angel, it was actually God that he was looking at? Can you help me understand all this? What's going on here? Come on, help me out, guys. Not that smart member. Not that educated. What's going on?
Someone, come on, help me out. Help me out, Glory. Did you disappear again, Glory? That's what he does. He disappears. It's like he gets raptured, but then they realize they need to leave him behind too. What's the answer? Yep, Jacob in another place. The reason why Moses could think that he was looking at God when the angel showed up and Manoah could think that he was seeing God in human form even though he knew it was the angel is because the angel is God. He's a messenger from God who happens to be God, which is why he can be called God. He calls himself God and receives the worship of God and does the things that only God can do. Clear? Do you get that, Light and Lizzie and everyone else? Are you getting all this? Do you want to make sure? Christian princes, every one of you? Yep, exactly. Now, to show you that the angel does what only God can do, Exodus 23, 20 to 23. You want to see God himself giving honor and glory and praise to this angel? Notice how God glorifies this angel in Exodus 23, 20 to 23. Amazing stuff, this Bible, huh? Supernatural. Let's read. Behold, I send an angel, a messenger before thee. So now God is speaking to Moses and through Moses. And he tells Moses, look, I'm sending an angel before you. To keep thee in the way. So he's going to preserve you and watch over you. To bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Now notice the warning. Notice the honor and glory that God gives this angel. Beware of him. Moses, Israel, be careful of him and obey his voice. You better listen to him. This is God. Can you imagine God speaking this way of someone else? Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Whoa. You see what God said about this angel? Moses and Israel, you better obey his voice and do not provoke him. Because I'm telling you, he, the angel, will, notice what God didn't say. He didn't say, I won't forgive you if you anger him. He won't forgive you. For my name is in him. Wow. Let me read the rest of it and come back to 21. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice. Notice what God says. If you obey him as I tell you to. And do all that I speak. So notice the unity. The distinction unity. Obey him. I speak. I speak. Obey him. Diversity and unity. Unity and diversity. Right. But if thou. Shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies. If you honor him and obey him, I'll be the enemy of your enemies, <clears throat> an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel, see, it's my angel, shall go before thee and bring thee unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You see the unity and plurality, diversity and unity? He will bring you in, I'll cut them off. Obey him, I speak. But now, what does this mean? What attributes must the angel have? The angel have. Notice my angel, two distinct entities. My, I, angel, two. What attributes must this angel have in order to guarantee the preservation of an entire nation in the wilderness, to preserve all of Israel, and in order to guarantee their ability to conquer all these nations, to defeat all these nations, making sure that Israel is not defeated? What kind of attributes must the angel have to do this and guarantee this? He's got to be all-powerful. He's got to be present with all of the all the Israelites, overseeing every one of them and preserving them. And he has to know who they are, how many they are, and where they're at. So even in this passage, you see the only attributes of the angel. <clears throat> but let's go back to Exodus 23, 21. One more time. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus strengthens my voice. One more time. Exodus 23, 21. Watch here. Not all of it. Just post 21. I love you fine, but not too much. Just post 21. I know you you want to put all of it, but can you post just 21? If not, I'll just read 21. Excuse me. Read with me. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not. For he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So now here is the explanation. How could this angel forgive sins, which is the divine prerogative? God explains it because my name is in him. My name is in him, therefore he can forgive sins or choose not to forgive. Remember what I said. Any lexical source, any commentary will confirm this. When you speak of name, you're speaking of a person's authority, his personality, his nature, his characteristics. 
By saying that my name is in him, God is saying what I am, he is. God's name refers to God's essence, his attributes, his authority. So by saying that my name is in the angel, that means God is saying the angel embodies my essence. What I am, he is. It's like John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. What God is, the word was. What God is, the angel is. Because the angel is what God is in nature and essence characteristics, he has the ability to do what God does, forgive sins. You catch it? So that means you have two divine persons, two distinct divine entities, God and his angel, both of whom embody the divine essence and can do what God does. Are you seeing this or no? Before I move on, is it clear? All right. Now, unfortunately for Israel, they didn't heed the warning. Remember what God said? Don't provoke him. Obey him. If you provoke him, he won't forgive you. Sadly, they provoked the angel and didn't obey him. Now, notice what the angel is going to say to them. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. How much time has elapsed? Can you let me know on the, on the live stream? Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. Sadly for Israel, they disobeyed the angel. They provoked him. They did not obey his voice. So notice what the angel says. Judges 2, 1 of 5. Tell me if this doesn't blow you away. <clears throat> and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. Notice what he says. Notice how the angel speaks. And he said, I, the angel, made you to go up out of Egypt, have brought you into the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, the angel said, I will never break my covenant with you. Wait. It's the angel's covenant, which he swore to the fathers of Israel, and he brought them up out of the land? I, I, my? Hmm. Notice verse 2. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Remember what God said? You better obey his voice. But here it says, you didn't obey my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I, this is the angel speaking, will not drive them out from before you, so I won't drive them out. Remember what God said? If you obey the angel, he'll drive them out. The angel says, you know what? I'm not doing it. You've upset me. You didn't obey me. I'm not driving them out. But they will be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. <clears throat> and it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bohim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Bohim means weepings. Okay, now... I'm really confused, man. Wow. You see, I'm getting confused a lot today, right? The angel says, I brought you out of Egypt. I'm bringing you into the land. It's my covenant that I swore to your fathers, but you did not obey my voice. Therefore, I won't drive them out. What does this angel think he is? Remember what God said about him? Don't provoke him. Obey his voice, for my name is in him. Well, they provoked him. They didn't obey his voice. So he didn't forgive them. Could it could it be any clearer? Honestly, be honest with me. Could the Old Testament be any clearer that this angel is no creature? He's God Almighty. Honored by God, glorified by God, God Himself. Can you imagine? God is warning Israel, don't mess with this angel. I'm warning you, Moses. This angel's not to be messed with. Wow. Who's this angel that God would give him such glory and honor? Right? Now let me show you where the angel forgives sins. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. The angel forgives sins. Right. You got it, please think. But we know it's God, even though he's called an angel. The reason why he's called an angel, please, because this is God's way of showing you in the Old Testament there's more than one divine person. God, the angel of God, the spirit of God. The angel of God is from God, and he happens to be God. So this is God's way of showing you the Trinity in the Old Testament. But now let's go to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. I may have to do another session. We'll see. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Watch here. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Notice the garments symbolize his sins. And stood before the angel, the angel. Hmm. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, The angel is now speaking. 
take away the filthy garments from him. So the angel is telling the other angels who are serving this angel. You catch it? This angel is ordering other angels. Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, the angel said to Joshua, Behold, I, the angel speaking, have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Wait. The angel removed his filthy garments, symbolizing the angel removing his sins. And the angel says, now I'm going to clothe you with righteous raiment, garments. Who does the angel think he is? He didn't say God removed your iniquity. He said, I, the angel speaking to you, have removed your iniquity from you, removed your filthy garments, and I'm going to clothe you in pure raiments. Wait, angel, what did you just claim to be able to do? Remove Joshua's sins. Really? Yep. Don't you remember what God said about me to Moses? God's name is in, him, in me. I embody the divine essence. And you better listen to me or I won't forgive you. And you're telling me this angel's a creature? This angel's a creature, huh? All right. So God and a creature can do what only God does. All right. Interesting. Is it clear that this angel is God and he does what only God can do? Now, I'm going to give you further proof that, again, this is Jesus Christ. You want further proof that Jesus Christ? Let's go now to Zechariah 3, same chapter, verses 1 to 2. And I'm going to sum up what you just learned. Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 2. Zechariah 3, 1 to 2. Now, watch who the angel is. Not only does he forgive our sins, he's our intercessor. He intercedes for the people of God. Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 2. Watch here. Read with me. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Notice, Joshua is a high priest. He's standing next to the angel of Jehovah. And Satan, he sees Satan here, standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, did you catch it? You have Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan at Joshua's right hand to accuse him before the angel in order to get him condemned. So how many figures in verse 1? Count. Joshua, high priest 1, the angel of the Lord 2, and Satan 3 to accuse Joshua. Now read verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord hath, that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now let me explain that last line. Jerusalem was set for destruction because of their sin. But God in his mercy saved Joshua from the fire from being consumed. So he's a branch, a brand that was saved. So what, what the angel is basically saying is, how dare you accuse Joshua, seeing that God has saved him from his sins and spared him? How dare you accuse him? So what is the angel doing? Defending Joshua, interceding for Joshua, rebuking Satan. Sound familiar? The angel intercedes for God's people and intercedes and saves them from the accusations of the accuser, Satan. Hmm. Who does that sound like? You catch it or no? The angel intercedes for God's people, saving them from their sins, removing their sins, and saving them from the accusations of Satan. That's what you just read. But I don't think you read carefully, because let's look at Zechariah 3, 1 and 2 one more time. Zechariah 3, 1 and 2 one more time. And he showed me Joshua thy priest, that's one, standing before the angel of the Lord, that's two, and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him, that's three. There's only three figures in verse one, but then in verse two it says, the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. Who is the Lord that's rebuking Satan? Who is this one who's being called Jehovah, the Lord, that's rebuking Satan in the context? Who is it here? Well, don't give me the name Jesus. Give me what, what appears in the text. The word Jesus doesn't appear there in reference to the figures. Who is it? Who's being called the Lord Jehovah who rebukes Satan in verse 2? Yes, the angel. Lizzie, MM, you got it? Please, now you got it. The only one who could be identified as the Lord there is the angel. Joshua can't be called the Lord. And God forbid, Satan can't be called the Lord. So you're left with only one, because in verse 1, you have the angel, Joshua, and Satan. So in verse 2, the Lord that's rebuking Satan in the name of the Lord has to be the angel. Here again, the angel of the Lord is said to be the Lord. Here again, the angel of Jehovah is said to be Jehovah. 
Wow, am I confused. If he's the angel of Jehovah, that means he's different from Jehovah. But he's also Jehovah? Yes. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. The angel of Jehovah is Jehovah, distinct from Jehovah, yet one with him. Wow, my head is hurting. Man, is my head hurting. My head is hurting, guys. Is it hurting you? So the angel of Jehovah is Jehovah who removed Joshua's sins because only God can forgive sins, and that's what the angel does because that's who he is. And the angel of Jehovah intercedes for the people of God, saving them from the accusations of Satan. So the angel of Jehovah is Jehovah, our intercessor, the intercessor of God's people in the Old Testament, who removes their sins and saves them from the accusations of Satan. Now let me show you that's Jesus Christ. Let's combine all this. Number one, the angel has God's name in him. Number two, the angel forgives sins, which is only something only God can do. Number three, the angel intercedes for God's people. Number four, God says you must obey the angels. Let me repeat these points. Number one, right, the angel embodies God's name. Number two, the angel removes sins, which is something only God can do. Number three, the angel intercedes for the people of God against the accusations of Satan. Number four, God says obey the angel. Now let me give you further proof this is Jesus Christ. Mark 2, 5 to 10. Mark 2, 5 to 10. The angel forgives sins, something only God can do. Mark 2, 5 to 10. Watch here. The angel forgives sins. Lord of God, we got this recorded. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, meaning the paralytic, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? So they're thinking within themselves, not, loud, not loudly. They're saying this in their hearts, in their minds. Who can forgive sins but God only? Yep, only God can. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, meaning Jesus, by virtue of his divine nature as God, immediately knew this is what they're thinking in their hearts. He could read their hearts. That they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, why reason these, these things in your hearts? So he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. He had access to their hearts. Could know what they're thinking internally. Because he's God. That's why it says in his spirit, meaning by virtue of his divine nature. But watch this, what Jesus says. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy? Is it easier to say to this par paralytic, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, which is easier. Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't prove or disprove it. But if I say, Get up and walk, and he doesn't walk, I just made a fool out of myself. Out of myself. But now notice verse 10 that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, Rise, get up, take your mat, and walk. And he does immediately. So the Son of Man has power to forgive sins like the angel has power to forgive sins. That's the first connection. Angel forgives sins. Jesus, the Son of Man, forgives sins. That's connection number one. Number two, remember God said obey him? Obey the angel? Mark 9, 7. Mark 9, 7. Mark 9, 7. Watch here. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. Isn't it interesting that when God spoke to Moses in Exodus, he was in a cloud? Are you making the connection? When God appeared on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, he appeared in a cloud and spoke to Moses inside the cloud. Isn't it interesting? Here's the cloud again, Mark 9, 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Connection number two. God appeared in the cloud with his angel to, to Moses. And from the cloud, he tells Moses, you and the people of Israel, obey the voice of the angel. Here's God again in a cloud on a mountain with Jesus. Because in Mark 9, 2 to 7, he took them to a high mountain. A mountain. Hmm. God appeared to Moses in a cloud on a mountain with the angel. Here in Mark 9, 2 to 7, God appears in the cloud again on a mountain with that same angel, his son, and he tells the disciples, this is my son whom I love. Hear him. Obey him. Listen to his voice. Hmm. You making these connections or no? Man, if this doesn't blow you away, then you guys are dead at heart. God forbid.
You're alive, filled with the Spirit. So like the angel, God appears in a cloud and tells the people, listen to his voice, hear him. And you know what's also astonishing? In Mark 9, 2 to 7, guess who's also there with Jesus? Moses. Moses is there with Elijah. Wow. History repeating itself. In Exodus 23, God is in a cloud with the angel on a mount with Moses. Tells Moses, obey the voice of the angel. Mark 9, 2 to 7. Moses is there. The angel is there. Jesus is transfigured. The cloud shows up. And again, the cloud with God the Father in it. And Jesus, the angel there, says to the disciples, this is my son whom I love. Hear him. Wow. And you're telling me this is not the word of God and that Jesus is not God in the flesh. Wow. Well, thanks for telling me there are people here who are dotted. I didn't even know. Sorry, guys. I didn't make I didn't mean to make you wait. Good news for Hatun and Patar. This is all archived. So you missed most of it, Patar, but don't worry about it. It's recorded. Parts one and two, Jesus Christ as the messenger of God in the Old Testament. Okay? So that's the second connection, right? Like the angel. Jesus forgives sins. Like the angel, you have to obey the voice of Jesus, hear him. What was the other connection? My name is in him. My name is in him. John 5, 43. My name is in the angel. John 5, 43. John 5, 43. One minute, Mark. Good. We're almost done. I am come in my Father's name. My name is in the angel. Jesus says, I come in my Father's name. My Father's name is my name. And ye receive me not. For if another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 28, 19. My name is in him. Obey his voice. He'll not forgive your sins. Jesus, the Father's name is in him. The Father's name is the Son's name. He forgives sins, and we better... Hear him and obey his voice. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, which is also the name of the Son, which is also the name of the Holy Ghost. Come on, is this a coincidence? God's name is in the angel. God's name is in Jesus. The angel forgives sins. Jesus forgives sins. You better obey the voice of the angel, hear him. You better obey Jesus' voice and hear him. And what was the other one? The angel of the Lord intercedes for the people of God. Romans 8, 31 to 34, specifically verse 34. Romans 8, 31, 34, specifically 34. Watch here. We're almost done. Part two is done. Then I can stick around. I'm going to shut down the live stream. Stick around for about another 20 minutes to answer questions if you have. Because I can't do a lot of nice live stream. I got to go pick up my daughters from school, Lord willing. But I'll be back on tomorrow, Lord willing. Especially for my weekly Bible class on Friday. Okay. But these are archived now. Go listen to them. So, Patar, you got about two hours of teaching on Jesus as the angel of the Lord. Some mind blowing stuff. All right. Now, let's go to Romans 8 31 34. Remember the connections with Jesus and the angel. Like the angel, God's name is in Jesus. Like the angel, Jesus forgives sins. <clears throat> like the angel, <clears throat> We are to obey the voice of Jesus, hear him. Like the angel, Jesus is the intercessor for the people of God. Here you go. Romans 8, 31, 34. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Exactly. He that spared not, not, spared not his own son. Lord willing, I'll explain what that means later, because this is meat here. But I can't do it because my time is <clears throat> close at end. But delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Real quickly, let me explain this real quickly. I'll go more in depth, Lord willing, in the future. Paul is saying, if God gave you the most important, dearest thing to his heart, the most valuable thing to his heart, his son, and the Holy Spirit is just as valuable and important, do you then think that God won't give you the rest? If you gave, if he gave you his best, that which he loves the most with the Holy Spirit, loves the Holy Spirit as well, the dearest thing to his heart, you don't think he's going to give you everything else when everything else pales in comparison? If he's willing to sacrifice the dearest thing to his heart, you better believe he's going to give you everything else. You understand the point what Paul is saying? 
Have no doubt. He's going to give you everything else. If he gave you the dearest thing to his heart, his son, you better believe he's going to give you the kingdom of heaven, the earth, immortality, physical incorruption. Because all of that is nothing in comparison to who Jesus is. And yet he loved you enough to give up even Jesus for you. That's the point. That should move you to tears and greater love and devotion. If you really believe this. Now 33, 34. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If you are chosen by God like Joshua was. Chosen. A brand plucked out of the fire. Chosen to be saved. Right? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemns? Who can condemn you if God has chosen you to save you? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Bam! Like the angel interceded for Joshua, because God had chosen him for salvation, spared him from destruction. Jesus is interceding for us if we're elect, chosen by God. So like the angel, Jesus intercedes. Like the angel, Jesus forgives sins. Like the angel, God's name is embodied in him. Like the angel, we are to obey his voice and hear him. Hebrews 7, 24 to 26. He verses 25. Hebrews 7, 24, 26. He verses 25. I'll make one more point. We're done. Hebrews 7, 24, 26. He verses 25. I'm going to ask you guys a question. <clears throat> Watch here. Hebrews 7, 24, 26. Watch 25. Before we get left behind, fine. Thank you for serving us for the sake of the Lord. Let's see. Uh-oh, we're about to leave you behind. We're getting raptured, Vine. Vine? Fine. Somebody, can you find, find the truth? Because he's lost. Can we find him? No, thank you. All right, let's read. But this man, because he continues forever, Jesus, continues ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, whereof he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth, he continues forever, never dies, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Like the angel, he removes sins, because he atones for sins as a high priest and intercedes for us. Could the evidence be any more clearer? Now, some of you haven't even heard the evidence. You came in at the end. Go back, listen, part one, all the way to part two. Isn't the evidence overwhelming? Jesus Christ is the angel of God in his pre-human existence. Is the evidence overwhelming? Jesus is the messenger of God who's not a creature, but an angel, a messenger sent from God who happens to be God. In fact, have you ever wondered why in the New Testament there is no angel that speaks like the angel of God? In the New Testament, if you go to the New Testament, when angels show up, when angels show up, they don't say they are God. They don't say I'm God. I am the Lord. They don't say I forgive you of your sins. They don't accept worship. They refuse worship and say they are servants, right? They don't say that God's name is in them. Why is it that in the Old Testament, this angel shows up all over the place, but in the New Testament, we no longer find that angel. Where is he? What happened to him in the New Testament? Why did he disappear? He did disappear. He's there under another identity. He's now known as Jesus Christ. The angel did not disappear. He became flesh and he's now known as Jesus Christ. He's always been there and he'll always be there. Because he's the one who loved us enough to become flesh to die for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, God Almighty, the angel of the Lord. We love you. Now let's end it with this. Psalm 34, 6 to 7. Psalm 34, 6 to 7. Watch here. Yeah, I think I've done enough on the angel. I don't need to do any more. But we got to talk about other things. Psalm 34, verses 6 to 7. Oh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. I'm not done yet. I got to leave you. I forgot. I'm not done yet. Oh, man, I forgot this one. I got to give you this one. Psalm 34, 6 to 7. This poor man cried unto the Lord, the Lord, I, I, I cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear, fear him and delivereth them. Did you catch it? The angel of the Lord surrounds, encamps round about all that fear him and delivereth them. 
So the angel has to be feared. And if you fear him, he will then encamp around you, no matter how many you are, to deliver all of you, all of us. What kind of attributes must the angel have to be able to be with all those who fear him to deliver them and save them? What kind of attributes? Notice he is to be feared. The angel Lord, you are to fear him. So what kind of attributes must he have? He must be omnipresent, present with all who fear him. He must be omniscient. He must know who fears him. And he must be omnipotent, powerful enough to then deliver all of them. But wait, that sure sounds like someone else. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28, 20? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The same angel who is with all those who fear him, who encamps all those who fear him to deliver them, is the same angel who speaks in Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always. I'm with all of you till the end of the world, the end of the age. Amen, Lord Jesus. You were there in the beginning, appearing as the Word of God, the messenger of God, who is God, interceding for your people, saving your people, forgiving your people, fighting your people, and you're still here with us and forever. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. Forgive us, Lord. Save us and truly make us your servants. Save my family. Fight for us. Fight for my wife and daughters for your glory. <clears throat> In Jesus' name. Now let's end it with this. Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Let's end it. And I'll talk more about that later. Okay. Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Right when I end this, and I'll let you talk because i got about 15 minutes. Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Watch here. Pay attention, guys. Be blown away. How many do you count? Pay attention and count with me. <clears throat> Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Jehovah of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. Watch. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them. This is God speaking. Only God can shake his hand and do wonders. And they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. What? For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I, God is speaking, shall shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. God is speaking, the Lord of hosts speaking, saying, I will shake my hand and make your enemies a plunder. And when I do that, then you'll know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Now read 10 and 11. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Let me repeat it again. Who's coming? Lo, I come, and I will live, dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord Jehovah. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord Jehovah that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Boy, am I blown away. God said, rejoice, I'm going to come and live in the midst of you, and many nations will be my people. And when I come to live in the midst of you, then you're going to know that the Lord sent me, the Lord, to live in the midst of you. You got you or no? The Lord is going to send the Lord to live in the midst of Israel. And on that day, when the Lord comes to live in the midst of Israel and gather nations to himself, then Israel will know that the Lord sent the Lord to live in our midst. That's what it says. It even says that in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. But in Jehovah's Witness Bible, it's better because it says, Jehovah of hosts has sent me to live in the midst of you. Jehovah sends Jehovah to live in the midst of his people and gather nations to Jehovah. And when Jehovah comes to live in our midst, then we're going to know that Jehovah sent Jehovah. <clears throat> it's right there. I'm not making it up. Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, I made no mistakes. If I did, correct them so I don't repeat them and save them from those errors. Everything that came from you strengthen us to believe with all our heart, not doubt, and live your word, love your word, and die for you, Lord. Save us, Lord. Save me from my flesh, from the things I struggle with, to be holy and healthy for your glory and provide for us. And save our family, our loved ones, my wife and daughters. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you. We love you. Please preserve us for your glory. 
You are the Father's beloved, his glorious Son, our God and Savior. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, guys. Well, not take care. Don't leave yet. Let me end it. Oh, no, no.